Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, what's up? Stigmatism in my soul TV. We here with La Kim Shabazz, one of the original members of the Flavor Unit. Peace, peace to man, woman, and child, the entire universe. God, La Kim Shari Law, formerly known as La Kim Shabazz Law. Peace. Yo, yo, La Kim, man, listen. Since pure righteousness, mm -hmm. black is back. Mm -hmm. First in existence, adding on. <laughs> uh, listen, yeah. let me tell you how. I was in Atlanta. I was at Morris Brown College in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know, this is during hip hop's golden era. Right. You out there, you competing with these monsters, because that's the best era in hip hop, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's been said that by others as well, mm -hmm. that the competition during that era was such that even Jay-Z couldn't compete. And he's in the same age group as us. Mm -hmm. He was opening up for Big Daddy. He couldn't even break through. That's how, you understand? Mm -hmm. How competitive that time period was. And you was out there. And I saw you. You had the kufi on. You had the dashiki. And you was talking this talk. Mm -hmm that I had never heard before to that extent. Now, I had heard dudes in the street, mm -hmm. you know, the 5% thing, and you know, they was talking, you know, trying to show and prove and build and all that. Mm -hmm. But Rakim sprinkled a little bit in his first album mm -hmm. and other albums, but your whole entire album was geared around this talk, and yo, it, it did something to me, man. And since that day, mm -hmm. I've been a fan of yours. Even my son now, he's seven. He puts the video on Black is Back and he lets it play. Peace. So, yeah, he, 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 he's, he's with that, man. So, listen, I'm glad you came, man, down to talk to the brother, man. It's my pleasure, brother. It's my pleasure. I'm honored. So, so listen, man, let's, let's, let's take off. Man. <clears throat> Where you from, man? I'm from Newark, New Jersey. Born and raised? Originally born and raised in North New Jersey. However, I've lived in, at times, in Brooklyn, Bronx, and Manhattan. Um, I've lived in East Orange, Orange. Right now, I'm in Elizabeth. Yet, originally from North New Jersey. Okay, where yeah. where in North? Like? Uh, Chadwick Avenue. I grew up on Chadwick between Clinton Avenue and Madison. Then we moved from Chadwick to uh, 16th Street. Off of uh, between 15th Avenue and 14th Avenue, I lived on uh, Vermont. Off of 18th Avenue, I lived on 4th Avenue on the north side of Newark. So I've been all around Newark, you know what I mean? But um, originally from Chadwick Avenue. Like Kim, all Newark public schools? Uh, yes. I, um, Where'd you I go to elementary school? To, I went to Avon Avenue Elementary School from uh, kindergarten to eighth grade, and then I went to Arts High. I did four years in Art Side. Uh, that's located on High Street in North. I was an art major, and I graduated in 1986 as an art major. Art you to draw or like musically? What, what? Well, I was. Um, uh, they had three different criterias when I went to Art Side. They had um, art, music, and drama. I was into the arts, actually, uh, drawing, painting, sculpturing, doctorism, contour drawing, you name it, photography paper machés, you know, painting on portraits with oil paintings, pastels, airbrushing, you name it. The arts, four years of it, and now, I still love it. Um, so you come out of, you, what year you graduated? Uh, 1986. 86, mm -hmm. okay. Um, what were some of your interests as a kid, mm -hmm. uh, sports? Oh yeah, well I played football, like uh, growing up in Newark, we didn't have many football fields, um, but we all played football. I grew up at a time where every street had a team. And you could ride through Newark in the early 80s at any given moment, and you'll see guys' football games going on, and everybody had a different color suit. We would go downtown to this store called Manning's or Green's, and they had every football team helmet, every jersey. You know, you could get your suit. So, we all would buy our favorite team suit, and when we played, everybody had on different <laughs> Mitch Mac suits. And the funny thing, sometimes we would play at a uh, Weekway Park. Yet where I lived at, there wasn't really no parks, man. They had an open space in the graveyard. 
that we played football in, man, we was rough, man. You talk about growing up in the hood, we ain't had no field to play football, so we played in the graveyard. But yeah, growing up, football was definitely one of my inspirations. Uh, also, Kung Fu. I got into Kung Fu at the age of seven and never stopped practicing. Um, so you into the martial arts? Yes, heavily into the martial arts. Um, Still? Yes. Self-defense is very important to me. Uh, I teach it to my children. Uh, everything that I've learned, I constantly keep it active. It keeps me healthy. It keeps me young. You know what I mean? And it taught me a lot of discipline. And it uh, goes in accordance with my culture, man. We're dealing with living mathematics. I always tell people the original man had two, two forms of power. His mental power and his physical power. Mental power that we exemplify is the truth. Physical power comes in your strength, might, right to self-control, and self-defense. The father of our nation was uh, very much into martial arts. When you study his history, you'll learn that he was a master in martial arts. Karate, jiu-jitsu, and learned many different systems. And this is something that he taught to the brothers. So I teach it too, that brothers should know some form of self-defense to be able to protect themselves, to be able to protect them, their families. Furthermore, it keeps you young. It keeps you healthy. So definitely, I love martial arts. All right, cool. All right, so, 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 La, now, <coughs> you raised, what, what nationality are you? Black. Okay, both yeah. parents black? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, one parent household, or you was raised in a two parent household? Uh, one parent household, actually, pardon me. One parent household, my mother basically was there, yet, um, her brothers were active in our life. Um, I'm grateful for, uh, uh my uncle Mustafa my uncle Raheem and my uncle Chuck. My uncles were members of the Nation of Islam. My mother never raised us on pork. I'm grateful for that. I've never partaken in swine. My mother never fed us pork before because my uncles were always around and they were prevalent members of the Nation of Islam. So the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad were prevalent in my household. I'm grateful for that because that kind of led me towards the 5% nation later on in life, you know? But I'm grateful, uh, you know, nah, but a one-parent household, however, my uncles were around, her brothers, so they were like my father figures. Who, my, who um, had the biggest impact on, who had the biggest impact and influence on you coming up as a kid? Who had the biggest impact and influence on me coming up as a kid? Actually, um, I love Muhammad Ali, I love Sugar Ray Leonard, Bruce Lee, definitely impacted me growing up, but as far as being a youngster, man, once I saw Roots on TV, as a child, I don't think nothing in my life impacted me like that. After watching Roots, I had a lot of questions, and those questions could never get answered. My mother couldn't answer these questions. The Christian preacher couldn't answer these questions. My grandmother couldn't answer these questions. My uncles gave me a little clarity on some of the questions I had, but Roots, the series Roots had a very very in what uh, way like in a uh a inquisition way i could never realize why they did that to us this is how black people came to america for real this is how we got here that's the impact it had on me as a child seeing us in the ships seeing kunta kente foot get chopped off seeing them beat him to make him say his name is toby the overall question i had in my mind was why why did this take place? And from the time I saw Roots in the fourth grade, from that point on, I began soul searching as to why these chain of events took place. Why were my ancestors brought over here like this in the first place? And no one could never really explain that to me. I never really gained understanding of that until I started studying the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, I became a member of the 5% Nation, started learning and studying the knowledge of myself, and then a lot of those answers became clear to me as to why these chain of events took place. But during my childhood, I would say that had to be one of the most impactful things that happened to me. I mean, growing up in Newark, I've seen a lot of different things, uh, gang life, all kinds of stuff. But looking back on my life at events that impacted me, the most as a child, Roots 
the series Roots because when I was a child is when it first came out. Right, I remember that. I, that I remember my mother making me my watch life. Too. Yeah, my mother, we had to do uh, homework assignments on it and everything. Yeah. So we definitely watch Roots. And it always mind boggled me as to why they did this to my people. Nobody could never explain that to me. Yo, yo, like, what I could was never it? get a satisfactory answer to that song. It didn't come until I started studying the knowledge of myself. Like, what was it like growing up in the 70s and 80s in New York? Oh, man, it was rough, but we played a lot. What I noticed, uh, the dynamic then was um, people exercised that slogan that came from Asia that they call Africa. It takes a village to raise a child. I grew up in a time where if I was playing out on the block and I did something unbecoming, and a neighbor saw that, smack you upside your damn head. I done been kicked in the ass at times. I'm down the hill somewhere where I know I'm not supposed to be. Somebody come behind me, boom, I turn around, it's one of my brother friends. Boop, what the fuck you doing down here? Get your ass out of here. I grew up in that type of era yeah. where the community looked out for one another. It was we more did. unity. It was a lot more unity. Um, also, we partied a lot. I grew up in the era where we had a party almost every weekend. We had basement parties. I'm talking about where you slow drag with a girl over in the corner. Nobody never got shot. The only thing that would ever happen, if some guys were beefing, they might fight. They may go outside. They scrap. That was that. I grew up in the era where we literally had discos. A lot of the youth in this day and time, they've never experienced a real disco. When they go out, they go to these spots, it's like a little bar front. They might have a little dance floor, what have you. They never experience Docs, Paradiso, Sensation, Zanzibar, Zanzibar Studio 54, Peppermint Lounge. Exactly. They've never experienced these things. So that's the difference. We grew up in the era where there was definitely more unity. Um, we had boys clubs. There was more activity with the youths. We had penny arcades. We had game rooms. There was a lot more activity with the youth. And I noticed my generation, the young men, this is a very important aspect of something that I don't see happening now. When I was in school, they made us take gym. You had to take gym every day. Physical education was important and you gym had was a class. to pass Gym. It was a class. It's not anymore. And because we took gym every day, people don't realize what that did for us as youth. That kept us in shape. There was no such thing as child obesity when I was in high school. Every now and then you might have a fat little chubby kid. Why? Because we took gym. And we love to go to gym. Most of the young men, we love to go to gym because we got to see the girls in their gym outfits. The girls got to see us. We took gym together, and they made us exercise every morning. They made us stretch. They made us do jumping jacks, and we had to run laps, and then they would allow us to play. Either if we wanted to play a game, if we wanted to play volleyball, we wanted to play basketball, if we wanted to tumble. That was another thing growing up. Uh, in my day and time, we learned how to flip. People would throw out their old mattresses and stuff, and um, we walk down the street, mattresses would be in a lot. One of our friends starts jumping on the mat, like, hey, look, so we get on it. We start jumping. Next thing you know, he tumbling. We're like, oh. So we'll try, you might land messed up and shit. After a while, you got it. We went from flipping and tumbling on old mattresses to flipping and tumbling on the grass. Keep in mind, we didn't go to no gymnastics school. Nobody taught us this. These are things that young children in the ghetto using a creative mind to enjoy themselves in their imagination. So we would use our creativity to have fun. And that was one of the things we used our creativity to do. We went from tumbling on mattresses to tumbling on the grass to tumbling on concrete. And to this day at 50, I can still do it. Yo, 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 La, it's, 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 it's cool that you mentioned that, man, because, uh, you know, we would play after we got out of school, at school, two-hand touch, kill a man with the ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was always 
going outside. It was never right. no staying in the house. And you know, I right. tell my son now, the only reason I'm letting him play the crib now is because it's cold. But as soon as the weather get right, right, bro, take go your outside, ass outside, man, enjoy yourself, right. man. Go see what your friends is doing. You ain't staying in here, right? Listen, what kind of music was playing in the crib, man? Oh was coming man, up? when I was growing up, whew, my mom's had every funky song you could think about. Uh, I come from a very, very musical family. Um, my mother, man, they had the largest record collection. And for me, as a child, I've always been attracted to music. Even when I was in about maybe, i say around third and fourth grade, because my mother always had every new hot song. Uh, there was always uh, Blue Magic playing, Whispers playing. Earth, Wind, and Fire playing, you name it. Um, so many different groups I grew up on. The Bar Keys, LTD, Commodores, Teddy Pendergrass, list goes on and on. The Dells, the Delphonics, Stylistics, all of this different music. The music of the 70s and the 80s was so creative to me. Uh, the difference in this day and time was that the music that we grew up on, you had bands. You, you would have you would have like 12, 13 members in a band. Playing and instruments. when we heard that song on the radio, it sounded beautiful. And then you look on the album cover, you see, damn, all of them came together and jammed together to make this one song. Whereas with now in this day and time, you can still get pretty much the same effect. However, they've transformed the instruments and put them into a machine. And a lot of people don't went away from using live musicians. So anybody that does record with live musicians, I commend them. That's something that I plan on doing. Putting together a funk band and actually make a whole entire album with them. I admire the roots. I admire Stead Society. Anybody who consider themselves a hip hop band, I admire that because you're keeping alive the elements of what we grew up on. Anytime I see the Roots, like I watch Fallon every night because the Roots is on it. I love Black Thought. To me, Black Thought is one of the best MCs I've ever heard in my life. And I know I'm nice, but I have no problem with giving credit where credit is due. To me, Black Thought, top notch. On my top yo, five, yo, straight yo, up. Yo. And I love the Roots because they keep not only funk, soul, and jazz alive, but they are musicians. They actually play instruments. I done seen these brothers tour with Jay-Z, copy his songs, play it. That's amazing to me. Our people went away from that. We went into, technology is fine. Everything, they done simplified the, uh, the process of recording and making songs. So to me, what that does is, is one thing to simplify the way that we do it, yet at the same time, it can have an effect where it's because it's become simplified, people are not putting more creativity into their music. You hear it. You hear it in what comes out nowadays. It's not a lot of love, a lot of passion going into a lot of this music that I hear. To me, it's generic, you know, yet it is what it is. Yo, 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 love, give me your top five and C's, man. Oh, man, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy, man. I always like, oh, man, that list is like, when people ask me that, I say, man, I don't want to be biased. You know what I'm so saying? So from it's 1976 crazy. up to 2019. From 1976. To 2019, include bro, everybody. Your growing up, growing up, my top five growing up was Cool Mo D, Grandmaster Cass, Cool Mo D, Grandmaster Cass, Cool Mo D, Grandmaster Cass. I like Master Rob from Fantastic Romantic Five MCs. I like, these are the people that inspired me growing up. You couldn't tell me nobody was better than Kumo D or Grandmaster Cass. Always loved Fearless Four, Tito, DLB, um, the Force MCs. Before they became the Force MDs, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people only familiar with them, uh, with Let Me Love You and all of that. However, to give you some history on them, them brothers was from Staten Island before the Wu. You talk early 80s. They specialize in harmonizing. Back then, most rap groups would harmonize during their performances. And, they, and we actually performed, gave some real good shows. It was choreographed and all shit. Um, but anyway, 
uh, the four MCs was really good at harmonizing. And um, it was three members. You had Stevie D, you had an MC named Mercury, and you had a guard named Cool by the name of Lord K1. So all of these people were very instrumental to me. So if you ask me for a top five, it's like, ah. Throughout the early 80s, I loved everybody, man. Now, me being a fan of Rakim, Kane, G-Rap, LL. Now, as far as when I got in high school, from, you figure, before I came out, from 83 up until, like, 89, my top five would be maybe Rakim, Kane, Cool G-Rap. LL KRS. Those were my top five. Okay, okay. You know what I mean? Then, once I came out, boom, I don't look at that no more. I'm like, all right, I'm in a world of MCs, and it's a million nice MCs. And when people ask me that question, I don't want to seem biased. You know what I mean? So I tell them, like, look, the original man is the Asiatic black man, the black man is the greatest MC. Period. The black man is the greatest MC. Yo, La, like yo, 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 La. What, what was your introduction to hip hop, man? How did you get introduced to it? What was the first time you remember hearing it? First time I heard it was probably hanging out in the playground and Sugar Hill Gang. Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight. Late 70s? Yeah, man, Rapper's Delight took us all by storm. That was just like. We all like the record Good Times, you know what I mean? But when that came on, we like, all right, this Good Times. We hear the bass line. But then these guys started mellow, talking to the music, but talking on beat. And it had a rhythm to it. So it was very catchy. It was something totally new. And most of us gravitated to it. So Sugar Hill Gang was the first song that I heard. And then after that, I heard Super Rhymes with Jimmy Spicer. Whereas a lot of people give Sugar Hill Gang a credit because they deserve it. You know, Rapper's Delight was a big song. However, Super Rhymes came out then, and that was also a big song. And he don't get the credit that he deserved because he rhymed way longer on Super Rhymes than all three of them combined on Rapper's Delight. Jimmy Spicer. Super Rhymes was big. So those were like really the first two songs that I heard. And then from there, I, anything that came out with rap, I was on it from when that you, point on. When did you start writing rhymes and MCing? Did you I think started, you start? I started writing rhymes because actually um, when I was in the eighth grade, this kid that was going to school with me, uh, his name was Bink, and he was from the Bronx. And he had moved over here. And this was at a time where the hip hop culture was starting to spread like the way of life for us to dress, uh, sneakers, the clothing, and everything. It started to spread from the five boroughs outward to places like Jersey, Philly, surrounding areas. We started to mimic and stuff, how they dress and stuff. So knowing my man Bink was from the Bronx, I'm like, yo, he from New York. Let me connect with him. Everybody out here in Jersey trying to mimic New York, trying to pick up their style, whatever, whatever. Let me get with him. So I got with Bink in the eighth grade. And uh, funny thing, man, one day Bink asked me, he was like, yo, you think your moms will let you come with me to the baseball game? I'm like, what baseball game? He like the Yankee Stadium. I'm like, ain't that in New York? He like, yeah, I'm like, how we gonna get there? He's like, my, mom, my aunt gonna take us. So I went home, I told my mom. She was like, yeah, you can go to the baseball game, whatever, whatever. So I get to his house. His aunt supposed to be taking us to the baseball game. His aunt never shows up. Now I'm in eighth grade. He's in eighth grade. He taking me to New York. We go downtown, we get on the path. I'm like, where your aunt at? He like, she gonna come? <laughs> I'm bugging, I'm a child, eighth grade, but I'm with my man, boom. Takes me to New York. We get on the D train, we get off on 161st. I'm like, yo, what's going on? He's like, yo, I'm just trying to show you, man. This is where I'm from. We got out the train, I'm in awe, I'm looking around, Yankee Stadium, whatever, whatever. I hear hip hop playing, and in my mind, I'm like, yo, I done struck gold. Cause everybody around in New York trying to act like they from New York, but I done connected with somebody that's right from here. So I know the music, the culture and everything. If I stick with him, I'm gonna learn a lot about this. So from getting with my man Bink in the eighth grade, we used to spend weekends in the Bronx. Me and him used to stand outside a disco fever. 
and watch the rappers come in. We little shorties, eighth grade, in the Bronx, and we standing outside of Disco Fever. Spending those weekends in the Bronx with him in the eighth grade, summer of eighth grade. We was over in the Bronx almost every weekend. I got the experience Zulu Nation anniversaries. I got the experience Bambada and them playing out live in their projects, seeing Cosmic Force MCs perform live, seeing Jazzy Five perform live. All of these tapes, me and Bink used to get all of these tapes of every group you could possibly think of. You talking Boogie Boys live, Crash Crew live, Sonic Force live, Cosmic Boy. Force live, Jazzy Five MCs live, Force MDs live, Cold Crush live, Treacherous Three live, uh, Fearless Four live, you name it. I had tapes with everybody. So all of these different groups were influential in uh, breeding me into the MC that I wanted to be. So, first time I pick up a mic is, um, what's that, summer of 88. Actually, I was a DJ. When I met my man Bink, I was already a DJ. Growing up in Newark, spinning club music was the shit. Mm -hmm. I got on two turntables and was spinning club music because I come from a musical background and you had a lot of club uh, DJ and crews in Newark at that time. So I was connected with my man C. Just. They had a DJ crew called Gentleman Elysia. You had another DJ crew called Gentleman and Neptune. You had uh, Tojo and Ab from Prince Street. You had another DJ crew from North called Mark IV. These DJ crews, wherever they played a party at, you wanted to be there because all the girls was going to be there was popular like that. Anyway, um, summer of 88, I was a DJ. So my DJ, we used to always invite Bink over his house. And my man Bink would rock tapes. My DJ would spin, break beats, cutting. And my man Bink would rhyme. And they used to always look at me like, yo, why you on rhyme? I'd be like, nah, DJ. They used to be like, you sure you on rhyme? I used to be like, nah. So my man one day, he was like, you know what? I just want you to write a rhyme one day. I'm like, huh, I don't do that. I DJ. He was like, still, I just want you to try. I'm like, why? He's like, because you always come over here with your man. He always rhyming on these tapes. And you be over there in awe, but you don't do nothing. I'm DJing, so you ain't getting on my turntables. But I just want you to write a rhyme. So I was like, all right, bump it. My DJ, his name is C. Just. So I wrote a rhyme. I came back. I kicked the rhyme for him. He liked it. He let my man born hear it, he liked it, and them two brothers gave me the inspiration to rhyme. Before then, I never rhymed, I was just DJing. Right. But my DJ convinced me to go ahead and start rhyming, and that was the first rhyme I wrote, and I've been writing rhymes ever since. How did you hook up with DJ Mark the 45 King and the Flavor Unit? Talk about the early part of that, the inception of that. Actually, I met um, 45 King when I was in the 10th grade. First time, my first encounter with him, uh, I used to deal with this kid named O.P. and his brother named Sharif, and they used to rhyme. Uh, I had to be in around about the 10th grade. So I um, used to burn trees together, whatever, whatever. A couple of times I rolled with him to get some trees. So I'm like, where you going to get trees from? He's like, I'm going to see my man on Stuyvesant and Irvington, right? So he'd go up to the room, and the room do it, give him the weed. So he kept telling me about, yo, DJ Mark, the shit, man, this, that, and the other. This kid named DJ Mark, he live in Irvington. I'm like, word, because they know I rhyme. I'm into hip hop. I'm like, word, well, let's go see him one day. He's like, yo, you know where I went and got that from? I'm like, yeah, he's like, that's him. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. <laughs> so he took me up there. First introduction I had with 45 King was through my man OP and Cherie. They introduced me to him. We kicked it, whatever. We burnt. That was that. Fast forward um, two years later, I had done graduated from high school. Um, at this point, I'm really rhyming. I done been through battle and cruise and North and the whole shit. And uh, I wasn't really concentrating on making no records or anything, but I was uh, inquiring as to how could I get a record played on the radio or whatever. It was at that time, just out of high school. So um, I'm rhyming, working on some demos, and I actually got managed by this Muslim brother named Abdul. Abdul took a liking into me. So uh, one day he said, I want to take you to meet somebody, boom, right? So I get on the bus with him, he takes me to meet this guy. When we got there, it was 45 King. So I'm like, yo, Ab, I met him before. He's like, you did? Yeah. So we go down Mark basement. He played my demo for Mark. Mark liked it or what have you. And I had to refresh his memory. I said, yo, you don't remember? He was like, nah, I said, I came over here a couple of years ago with OP and Sharif. He like, oh yeah, I remember you now, right? So he liked my demo, 
that was that encounter with Ab. Management with Ab didn't work out too well. This is from like 86. That was my second time meeting Mark. So after that, I left Ab alone and I'm messing with my cousin Born. My cousin Born was a, uh, how can I say this? He's a very entrepreneurial brother, getting money, and he knew biz, he knew a lot of people. You know, real flamboyant, fly brother. This Mark. Yes. So Born, knowing that I rhyme, he would connect me, he would take me to see Biz in Cool V. And I would rhyme for Biz, and Biz and Vaughn took a liking into me. They was like, yo, you sound like a little cane. Listen, I'm working on the Vapors album right now. I don't really have time to work on you right cool now. Cool V's from Jersey, ain't Yes. You? And um, they just told me like, look, man, just keep rhyming, doing what you're doing. Vaughn gonna keep coming, bringing you through. And when I'm done with the Vapor shit, I'll work with you. Me, I was an eager beaver. I wasn't trying to wait on Biz and Vaughn. So I would keep going to see them. I'm rhyming over Vaughn House, Biz, loving it. We cool. I'm going to shows with them in the whole night. I'm rolling with Biz and Vaughn. One day, I just said, you know what? Because this was at a time where Red Alert was playing 45 King shit. Now I would hear Chill Rob on the radio. I ain't never met him. I would hear certain shit coming from the 45 King on Red Alert. So I'm like, yo. I'm waiting on biz, but at the same time, I got a whole arsenal of work I'm ready to release to the world. So one day I just asked Vaughn, I'm like, Vaughn, you know 45 King? He like, yeah, you know him? I was like, yeah, I met him. He's like, oh, what's up? I was like, you got his number? He's like, you know him, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I ain't here. Boom. He gave me his number. I called him. Like, yo, you remember me? He's like, huh? I was like, remember I gave you the demo, the song, Girly, Girly, Girl? He was like, oh, yeah, I remember you. You still rhyming? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yo, I want to come check you out. He's like, no problem. He asked me, did I smoke? Still, I was like, yeah. He's like, you can bring me some herb? I'm like, yeah. So I called a cab up the orange, and I connected with Mark, and I rhymed for him. And that was the first time he was living in um, Orange with a producer named Vaughn Mason. Anyway. Um, from Rock State Bound. Yes, yes. Bound. Uh, I did that for 45 King, connected with him. Then I went back home. About a week later, he called me. and was like, what you doing, Lock Kim? I'm like, not much. He's like, could you come to my house? I'm like, yeah. So he just called me out the clear blue. I come over there. This time I get up there, it's dudes in there rhyming. I'm nervous. I come through the door. It's three big, about four dudes in there rhyming. They all bigger than me, and they sounding dope. Mark opens the door. He lets me in. I'm like, peace, peace. I shake everybody's hand. He got the beat playing. They already rhyming. Come to find out it was uh, it was Lord Ali Bascazar. That's Apache's cousin. Chill Rob G was rhyming on the mic that day. Double J was rhyming on the mic that day. And Apache was rhyming. Now, I hadn't met none of them. I had just met them right then and there. Come through the door, Mark playing the beat, they rhyming. Uh, now, so, these, are these some of the original members of the Yeah, Flavor these unit? are all original members. Apache, Lord Ali Bosky, Chill Rob G, and Double J. What the about Queen Latifah? She, she wasn't there, there at that moment. Um, so you come through the door, I they come through the they, door, they, they rhyming, they get busy. So they put me on the spot. They like, yo, you the new dude, right? That came over here, you rhyme, right? I'm like, yeah, they like, yo, get on the mic. We want to hear you. So they put me on the spot. I don't know none of these dudes. And I come in and they killing it. Now me, I've always been attracted to Treacherous 3, Tila Rock, mm. um, Fearless 4 and them. I love their voice. I love their cadence. I love their delivery. And I always love the way they flow. Apache sounded just like them. I'm like, yo, he sound. <laughs> I'm like, yo, he sound just like the dudes I look up to. So I'm like, mm. so it's my time to get on the mic and rhyme. I'm nervous, but I just killed. I rhyme. And after that, they loved me. So um, Mark moved from Orange, and he had moved to Irvington, back in Irvington on Stuyvesant. And every now and then, he would call me and invite me over there. And I got over there, then I met Latifah. She was there, he let me know this is the girl. She rhymed with us, used to come over there, and all of them would be there at times. You know, I would get over Mark House, the entire flavor unit would be there. Lord Ali Bosky, Double J, Apache, Lati, Latifah. You had other people, um, my man Ruler Lord Ramsey, he didn't rhyme, but he was always around. Manager Shaq Kim, he never rhymed, he was always around then though. They were all friends. Chill from Rob Irvington did Hot. Chill Rob too. These are all the original Flavor Unit members. You had another brother by the name of Tahid. Him, Apache, and his other brother named T. Capone 
had a song that Red Alert used to play. The hook used to go on, um, get with the God on the rock shock, stay on the layback, stay back. If you really want it, I'll jump beside, I'll jump beside, no, I'll jump beside, Patchy, you jump on it. And it was three of them. Red Alert used to play that. If you go into Red Archives, you may hear that. But anyway, um, I would come over 45 King's house, and they would all be there, and we would just rhyme together, man. And when I met them, you know, it was at a time where most hip hoppers had names far as for their groups or their crews or whatever. You had posses and you had crews. So La T had the song out, This Cuts Got Flavor. Yo, so classic. We always had that flavor this title. This Cuts Got Flavor. Because we would look at other crews that's out and nobody had flavor in their crew. So we was like, yo, we was trying to come up with a name to call ourselves. And everybody was like, yo, we the flavor posse. We the flavor crew. I'm like, nah, yo, cause see, I'm the only one in the crew that was God. I'm a five percenter, so I'm thinking along the lines of unity and we together. So I'm like, nah, yo, I think we should call ourselves the flavor unit. So everybody looked at it. That was it. you? Yup. Everybody looked at it like, yeah, that's good, because I figure unit is the root word to unity. And we form an a oneness with each other, uh, a collaboration of MCs who bring up multiple different flavors, yet we stemming from one source, the 45 King, and we are one. So that's how we came up with the name Flavor Unit. Yo, you know, yo, I added the word unit to it. Yo, 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 La, um, I've watched one of your videos and get, you know, prepared for this one, and, and you mentioned that you had an impact on the early Queen Latifah, her album, her mm -hmm. first album was a classic, man. I still, you put it on today, is the album still money, man. That's right. Could you and speak to me to personally, you know, not taking nothing from other female MCs and I'm not trying to be biased either. However, Latifah digging most of these females' asses. I'm telling you, if I get in her ear, I'm telling you. <laughs> yo, 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 yo. Latifah nice on the mic. Don't y'all ever forget that. Yo, 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 La, what was, what was, because you said you had like an impact on her, because her, her first album was very pro-black. It was very conscious. Mm -hmm. Could you add some color to What that? I'll say is this. Um, we all came out at a time where it was a lot of consciousness going on in hip-hop. I mean, Latifah came out at the time where you had your public enemies, you had the, uh, you know, KRS-One, KRS X-Clan, Kane. So it was a lot of consciousness out there at that time. And that had a lot to do with her album, her also being affiliated with Native Tongue. Even though Latifah was a member of the Flavor Union, she was also a member of Native Tongue. Like Native Tongue, Juice Crew, and Flavor Unit was somewhat family. We never battled each other. We never took shots at each other. Now, now, Native I think I think Marley and Mark may have uh, been competitive far as with beats. You know, producers want to be the first one to use this kick, the dope, this snare, right. or I was the first one to use this loop. But far as with like one thing I noticed. It was a lot more unity when I was out there. Like, we would connect with everybody in hip hop. Native Tongue Crew consisted of De La Soul, Jungle Tribe Called Quest, Jungle Brothers, Boogie Down Productions, and Black Sheep. They were family to us. We all embraced each other, and even with the Juice Crew. Whenever Kane performed somewhere, whenever Biz and them performed, they called us and let me know. That's how I told you. I was with Biz and them before I got with 45 King. So my relationship with Biz and Vaughn never changed just because I was with the Flavor Unit. In fact, Biz and Vaughn used to be over there just as much as any other Flavor Unit member. Biz would come to Mark House with records. Mark, I bet you ain't got this. Play some shit, Mark would come over. Yeah, Biz, that's dope, but I bet you ain't got this. So Biz was always around. And Juice Crew and Native Tongue and Flavor Unit, we were all like extended family, always. So, so, so Queen Latifah, did you used to build with her? Did yeah, well, not a lot because I was still young in the knowledge at that time, you know, but what I had, it was radiating in me. So certain things she would pick up on, like even the title Queen, I'm pretty sure she got that from, I was influenced uh, in her with that. 
because I brought the knowledge that the black woman is the queen. And you should be the queen. The queen is a woman who knowledge is God so she could build by her side. So her coming out as Queen Latifah instead of Latifah, yeah, I may have had something to do with that because we was around each other. Did I have everything to do with that? No, I'm not going to take full credit for that because she's a queen. She know who she is. You know what I mean? It's just that me being a member of the 5% and being amongst them and in my atmosphere, they're going to pick up on certain things because I'm going to be me. I'm going to speak the language of God. And if you're amongst me, you're going to hear certain things. You're going to pick up on certain things. But she was already conscious, and it was a conscious error. So, you know, yeah. But I did some writing for her, you know, did things you get of that nature. On her song with, with the 45 King, King and Queen Creation, mm -hmm. there's some writing credits on there. Mm -hmm. um, did you get any writing credits on her album? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I wrote a whole song for her, um, the song Queen of Royal Badness. And me and Apache wrote rhymes on Ladies First, and we also wrote rhymes on King and Queen Creation. Yeah. But that's just out of love, you know. Yeah. Whether she had put my name down there, writing credit or whatever, it didn't really matter. She was the sister in our group. I've written rhymes for Apache that the people will never know. Apache has written for me. We did that with each other. Like, I just did a dedication song for him. And one of the, in the verse, I say, um, this is more than just a dedication. To me, it's an intricate form of meditation. I feel different. Throughout the years, I still glisten. Yet a very important part of me is still missing. See, any time I wrap my hands upon the microphone, I think of you, Patch, and realize that you're gone. We kept the blades sharp. We was grown and made stars. Critique each other verses, rehearse it, and trade bars. Yeah. And we be so tickled. We laugh and go giggle. It's sad. Only speak to you now through smoke signals. At times I think about all the rhymes I wrote with you. Singing, can it be? It was all oh, so simple. And it's a hell of a trial and obstacle. So I pour out a little liquor for you and pop pistols. Shed tears for years and went through boxes of tissue. Living life without my partner and rhyme. Patch, I miss you. Yeah. Yo, 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 love. How did you get involved? Mm hmm. First of all, what's your government name? Uh, Lakeem Sharik Welch. That's my honorable name that I was uh, given at birth. Okay. How did you get involved with the Nation of Gods and Earth? Uh, the 5% Nation. Um, 5 I was in, um, had to be uh, the summer of uh, 83. I used to run behind my cousin. Uh, his name is actually Lamel Bourne now. But um, I used to run behind him and... Um, we were visiting this guy in um, Prince Street Projects named G. At the time, his name was IZ. And I didn't know at this time that my cousin had embraced the teachings of the 5%. So anyway, make a long story short, he was writing graffiti on the wall, and he had wrote on the wall, 5% of the black man is God. And I'm at 13, I'm watching him write this on the wall. So I looked at him and I asked him, I said, um, why you write that? He was like, what, 5% of the black man is gone? I'm like, yeah. Why did you write that? He said, because the black man is gone. I said, huh? I said, I'm a black man. So that means that's talking about me. He like, yeah. But there's certain things you would have to know to be able to be one with this. So I just basically, you know, I was intrigued by that. Why did you write that? 5% of the black man is gone. So from right there, he saw that I was interested and he started teaching me mathematics, alphabet, 12 jewels that's all we had at that time this is back what are the 12 what, what, what are the 12 jewels the 12 like? jewels is a lesson to my understanding that was composed by minister malcolm x it was a lesson that was given out in the nation of islam or um, somehow some way it got out here into the streets and uh it basically uh is a lesson that's um there's 12 principles there's uh knowledge wisdom understanding Freedom, justice, equality, food, clothing, and shelter, love, peace, and happiness. Uh, that was a lesson that we had acquired from brothers coming home from jail and shit, and they was passing these lessons around. So my first introduction to the 5% Nation came by way of that. My cousin writing it on the wall, me taking an interest in it, and he started teaching me supreme mathematics, supreme alphabet, and the 12 jewels from there. Uh, that's all we had for about two years. Uh, one day we were traveling to New York. It was me, my cousin Lamel, and his brother named IZ. We was on the platform and we was going through the mathematics. And this uh, tall brother, he had on all black, he was sharp. 
while we had a suit and tie, he had a briefcase with him, he overheard us. So he came over to us, he introduced, he said, peace, my name is God Jamel Allah, what's your name? So I told him my name is, at the time my name was understanding, my brother's name was born, and the other brother's name, he called himself Wonderful IZ. So the tall brother looked at the brother, he said, your name Wonderful IZ? He said, yeah, he said, well, what's so wonderful about you? Tell me what's so wonderful about you. The brother Izzy was stuck. He couldn't say nothing. So this brother Jamel, he saw that we was going through the mathematics. So he introduced himself. He started building with us. And myself, my cousin, and the brother that eventually became my DJ, we took a liking into See, Jamel. Just. Right. We took a liking into Jamel. And throughout high school, Jamel would teach us you know, different aspects of the lessons. And eventually, we eventually ended up getting our first set of 120 through him. Uh, the first uh, universal parliament that I went to in Brooklyn, which is Medina, he took me to. And, uh, you know, that's just a part of my history with becoming a member of the 5% Nation. It came by way of my cousin first. Then we met a brother named Jamel, who eventually got 120 from. And, um... I figured around about 90, 1990, 91, I met this brother by the name of Prince Naquan Law, and through him, I started renewing my history, meaning going back from my foundation of what I started with and going back all the way through the lessons. Because every time I connected with a new group of gods, you know, and my lessons came up out of Medina, they said a 120 may have came up out of Harlem somewhere else. So certain things was worded different. Like if I quote a particular degree and they quote it, I might have a word or, or a print that's different than what they saying. And we was taught that if we all be together every day, then we want to all be kicking the same lessons. So what I had to do once I got with Prince Naquan, I got a set of they 120, memorize it. So now when I'm traveling with him, and them brothers, we going through the lessons, we all kicking the same thing. From him, I met an older brother by the name of Born in Law. And Born in Law was actually the first brother that really walked me through these lessons and actually showed me the living reality of how this was supposed to be lived. Before I connected with Born in Law and Prince Naquan, it was more so of a fad to me, something to be involved a lot with. Of dudes was I didn't like really that. start seeing the seriousness in it until um, I got a little older. As a teenager, it was something to be involved with, yet I wasn't really serious because I didn't have nobody actually teaching me. I didn't literally have nobody actually teaching me and walking me through step by step through each degree the way it was intended. When the law taught the brothers, he told them to teach this word of mouth. First of all, the way we was getting it, a lesson was handed to us and told us to memorize it. And that was never right and exact. The man that started this, he said, if you're going to teach this, teach this word of mouth. He said, don't keep this in no book, son. You got to hold this up here. If you can't hold it up here, it's not meant for you. Because you could lose a book. Your book of life got to be up here. So if you are that strong and you really want to learn this, I should be able to convey each lesson to you word of mouth. And you use your memory, your brain power to receive those lessons. To the point that you memorize it, you quote it 100% right and exact over and over and over and over to yourself. To the point that when I come see you the next day and I ask you that degree, you should be able to tell it to me. So once I know it came from my mind to your mind and I know you got it 100% right and exact, now I may give it to you on the paper. Because I know you got it now. Whereas the way we was getting it. It was just handing us the lesson and telling us to memorize it, and that wasn't right exact. You're supposed to teach this word of mouth. The lessons, the teachings are supposed to be conveyed from one mind to the next, not given to you on no paper. You know what I'm saying? Look. There's a lot of times what happens with that. If I give a person, right, per se, I'm going to just give you a quick example. If I give a person a set of mathematics on paper, and I write a manifestation for each one of them, when you ask that individual how they see knowledge, what they going to always say? If all they know about knowledge is that paper you gave them and you told them to memorize what's on that paper, then every time you ask them what do knowledge mean, they're going to say that manifestation that's off of that paper because you didn't give them the power to exercise their mind to draw up what knowledge is themselves. So me telling you what knowledge is 
and you're receiving it in your mind and you take that home with you and you don't have no paper, all you know is the words that was received. And you let that resonate with you and the next time I see you and I ask you what knowledge is, if you could tell me that lets me know that it resonated with you and that you could hold that. So now I'm going to teach you the next principle and I might give it to you on the paper after I know that you got it now. You know what I'm saying? And that's the proper way that we're supposed to teach. La, could you ask some color for us about the 5%, the 10%, and the 85%? Could you speak to uh, that? Well, basically, that's a breakdown of population. When you look at 100% of the population, the meaning of 5% is they're the poor righteous teachers who do not believe in the teachings of the 10%. Who is all wise, who know who the true and living God is, who teach that the true and living God is the son of man, supreme being black man from Asia, who teaches freedom, justice, and equality to all the human family of the planet Earth. Otherwise known as civilized people, also Muslim and Muslim son. The meaning of a 10% is that they are the rich slave makers of the poor, who teach the poor lies to believe that the almighty true and living God is a spook and cannot be seen with the physical eye, otherwise known as blood suckers of the poor. The meaning of the 85% is they're the uncivilized people, poison animal eaters, slaves from a mental death of power, people who do not know the true and living God or their origin in this world and worship who they know not, who are easily led in the wrong direction yet hard to lead in the right direction. So basically, three divisions of people. You could keep it simple and plain. Look at it like this. 5% is people that embrace the truth, power, righteous people, righteous people. 85% of people are people that are lost. They blind, they don't see themselves for what they supposed to be. They dumb because they can't speak effectively. They deaf because they tone a deaf ear to the truth when the truth is presented to them. And this is the majority of our people. They're easily led in the wrong direction, they're hard to lead in the right direction. The 10% is your ruling elite class. It's not hard to figure out who the ruling elite class is. They got their claws and everything. They the rich slave makers of the poor. Any mind frame of a person that want other people to do all the work for them, yet they want to take the credit for that work. And at the same time, get rich off of your labor and keep you blind to the knowledge of yourself by teaching you lies. That's the 10%. So that's what we mean by 10%, 5%, and 85%. Love, triple stage darkness. Triple stage of darkness. Triple darkness is known as, if you take away all light right now, all light, what do you have? You have blackness. Blackness. Before there was any molded matter in the universe, there existed total darkness. We say triple because it is a known scientific fact that anything Allah creates, he creates the dimensions of density, which are length, width, and depth. So when we speak upon total triple darkness, we speaking upon a stage of darkness where there is no physical matter anywhere. Triple darkness is what you have when you take away all light. The sun is the first completion of life in the physical universe and everything in our solar system depends on the life giving nutrients and energy of the sun in order for them to exist. That's the great illuminary star, which powers our solar system. If you take that sun away, or you could look at it like this. Anything that burned that long and hot at its core has to be black. Because chemistry teaches you that when you apply heat to physical matter, it causes the molecules in that matter to speed up and return to their original form. If we apply heat to any physical matter long enough, it turns black. So when we speak upon total triple darkness, we're talking about the darkness of space. The empty darkness of space that always existed before there was any molded matter. The way it becomes triple is because it says that in the beginning there was just empty void in space. And it says that Allah produced a self-created atom. This atom produced the flow of life. And this atom starts spinning in darkness at 24 billion miles per second. And it produced a level of life traveling in a circular motion. That first level of life produced a second level of life traveling at 24 billion miles per second. Now you got two levels of darkness or energy in the universe traveling at 24 billion miles per second. 24 and 24 gives you 48 billion. This second level produced the third level of darkness and rotation in the universe. 
So when we speak upon total triple darkness, this is what we're speaking upon. Levels of darkness traveling at 24 billion miles per second, which was actually the birth of the first atom, which, which is actually which brought forth the formulation of the great luminary star known as the sun which gave birth to our physical solar system. So when we talk about total triple darkness, total triple darkness is where everything comes from and where everything must return to, supreme blackness. But the way you get triple is because the levels of light that produce this atom produce the flow of light that traveled at 24 billion miles per second. That produced another level of light traveling at 24, which produced the third. Everything that the law of creation creates in dimensions of density, limb, width, and depth. So you got three. Three is the magic number. Three means to understand, to see things for what they are and not what they appear to be. Just like you got man, woman, child, sun, moon, and star, mm. limb, width, and depth, measurement, weight, and height, gas, liquid, solid. One, two, and three. So triple darkness. One level of darkness, two, three, all in one. Your love. One of the major tenets of the 5% nation is the black man, the Asiatic black man is God. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you add some color to that for us? Yes. Please. Uh, the original man, the first lesson that we study and the lesson that we get called the student enrollment is who is the original man? The answer to that is the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, father, civilization, God of the universe. Original in itself is an adjective that means first. It implies the best knower. Uh, man in the highest sciences of life means intelligence. So when you look at original man, you're saying who is the first intelligence? The answer is the original man, the first intelligence, is the Asiatic. I'm gonna stop right there. Asia is the name that the original man named the entire planet. If you study the origin of the word Asia, you're not gonna find one. You're not. You're not gonna find the origin of the word Asia. We done done this plenty of time because Asia is the name that the original man named this entire planet. This is why we call ourselves the Asiatic black man because Asia is the name of the entire earth. It's not just, you know, the part of Asia that you see when you look on the globe, no. The entire earth is named Asia. We do a scenario now when we're teaching in the class. We pick up a globe after they've learned the knowledge degree. And you know that the black man is the Asiatic black man. I hold up a globe in front of the class and ask them, show me where we come from. And some people look on the globe, they'll point to Africa. Some people look on the globe, they'll point to Asia. They'll point to a certain location. And I tell them, no. They said, what do you mean? I hold up the globe. Show me where the black man come from. And then one of them came and they say, picked up the whole globe. They said, this, the whole entire earth. I said, yes, the whole entire planet is named Asia. So this is why we say we the Asiatic black man because the black man named the planet Asia. Attic is where you store things at. Just like in your home, you store things in your attic. So Asia being the land that would be body attic your storehouse would be your mind so the original man is the asiatic black man meaning the earth is his he named this planet his and he kept and preserved the best part for himself asiatic that's saying body and mind of the dominant intelligence because black means dominant man means intelligence so this is what we mean by asiatic black man asia is the name that the original man named the planet and it's a body, it's the land, the whole entire earth is Asia, and it belongs to the black man. He's God? Yes. God is only saying good orderly direction, the highest form of existence. The black man is truly the highest form of existence. Out of everything living, you got four kingdoms that exist. You got plant life, mineral life, human life form, and animal. And the black man is the greatest. All a black man got to do is study the knowledge of himself and he will learn that he is the greatest creation in the universe. He and only he composed all 92 natural elements that exist in the earth to form this body, this physical five-pointed star. The first star to come upon the planet earth is the black man of law. 
He got five connecting points, arm, leg, leg, arm, and the supreme head. I say supreme head because the black man's head has supreme access to all the divine intelligence that's given all by the mind because he is the mind manifested in flesh in the physical form. This is what makes him God. He's the highest form of existence. His body, his molecular structure, his atomic structure, his biochemical makeup is greater than everyone. He has seven and one half ounces of original brain. The black man does. He is older than the sun, moon, and star. He has no said birth record. He always was and always will be. He's the greatest civilizer and the greatest of planets. And he shows no qualm in showing you that he's the God. Look at us. We dominate everything. Anything you put in front of the black man, he shows his godliness. Look at us in the boxing ring. God. Look at us on the mic. We the God. Look at us with literature. We show and prove we the best. Anything we touch, we show and prove to be supreme at it. The original man. That's right. Yo, La, you filmed you, you filmed the video in Egypt. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've been to Egypt three times. Mm -hmm. Went into the Sudan, uh, South Africa, Swaziland, you know, mm -hmm. doing a lot of research on uh, you know, my black history and my mm -hmm. roots and, mm -hmm. and one one life changing event was going to Egypt, man. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like? When, when did you go? What was it like for you to go to Egypt? I went over there. Uh, it had to be around Born Wisdom '92. It was lovely, man. I had always wanted to do a video. They always said that um, if I make any records, I get to do any videos. I would love to travel to Egypt, Kemet. Actually, it's the original name of that land. Uh, Europeans named that land Egypt, but it's Kemet to us. I always wanted to go to Kemet and um, once I put that idea to the record company that I was signed to and they sent me there, man, I was exuberant. I stayed in uh, Egypt for a week. I was in three parts of the country. I was in Luxor, Aswan, and Cairo. That's and it was Nubia. just, uh, yeah, the land of the black faces. And uh, it was just a beautiful experience for me, man, to actually be right there and to actually ride on a camel, to actually film a video with me building about the tribe of Shabazz right there in Kemet where our people built these great monuments. You know what I mean? It was beautiful, man. What's the Lost Tribe of Shabazz? The, okay, we're going to wrap this up. The Lost Tribe of Shabazz is known as a tribe of people throughout history. Uh, you had a scientist by the name of Shabazz. And this is supposed to happen 16,000 years ago. And Shabazz um, was a scientist who rebelled against the kings in his day and time and took his people into the jungles of Asia, which they call Africa. Shabazz knew that by taking his people into the jungles, he would be transgressing the law because he held a meeting with the kings and asked the question, of, is it written that the black man should conquer the jungles of Asia? And they clear as day told him no. Yet it is written that the black man would go astray. Anyway, Shabazz rebelled, took his people into the interior of Asia that they call Africa. And from them being there, they eventually lost touch with civilization and started to live a jungle life. From them being out there in the thickness of the humidity and things of that nature, the noses grew wide. But because of the insects and things of that nature, the lips grew thicker. Shabazz was the one who knew that the black man's body could adapt. To different climates and situations and things of that nature. Also, it is recorded that Mr. Yaku was born up out of this tribe. They dealt with the science of grafting. So, this is where you get the story of the tribe of Shabbat. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that some of the first slaves that were brought over here were from the tribe of Shabbat. So, this is where you get the story of the lost tribe of Shabbat. So, we was taught that our people went through that. They were some of the first people that were brought over here on the slave ships, the Lost Tribe of Shabbat. So the reason why I wrote that song is because I had a little knowledge and history about that. And it's in accordance with the teachings from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He taught that the lost sea over here in the wilderness of North America, the so-called Negro that was made a slave, they are the lost seeds from the Lost Tribe of Shabbat. So that's why I brought that out. And that song letting the people know, like, look, this is where we originally from. These are certain things that we built. The entire planet is ours. Yet I chose Kemet because people glorify Egypt. They look at the uh, 
the great statues, the great monuments, and they mystify as to how these things were built. But we built these things. The black man always been a wise scientist in mathematics and geometry. All sciences that exist, you name it, it came from us. We the original people. Everything. Aerodynamics, mechanical engineering, the science of an irrigation system, you name it, sewage system, you name it. We built all of these things. All of these sciences existed in us. So I wanted to show the world because of the knowledge that I was studying, you know what I mean? I didn't have uh, as much understanding that I have now. You know, I was like 20 something years. Uh, I was 20 something years old back then when my album came out and I made that song, Lost Tribe of Shabbat. Now that I've been an active member of the 5% Nation now for 30 some odd years, I have a lot more understanding that I could bring to the people in reference to the Tribe of Shabazz. But that's basically um, what that means. You know, the Tribe of Shabazz is a part of our history that I learned about through studying the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, um, you know, that's why I brought that to the world. To let the world know that we are actually the lost Tribe of Shabazz. We was once lost, but we found Somebody came and found us. He was known as Prophet W.D. Farad Muhammad, and he raised up a messenger to bring us the message. He's known as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad brought us the message. Far brought us the knowledge of who he was. Elijah Muhammad developed supreme wisdom. What our father did, Almighty God of Law, he took that knowledge, that far shared, and that supreme wisdom that Elijah shared and added it together. One plus two on the year three. I just got finished building with you about triple darkness and how three is that magic number because three is the number that enables you to see. Knowledge is what you know, wisdom is what you say. If you know what you're saying, then you should be able to have some type of clarity or clearance or bring clearance to the world about it. And this is what Allah did. Allah added up that knowledge that Far gave us and he added up that wisdom that uh, Elijah shared with us and gave us supreme understanding. He gave us a supreme understanding on what Elijah was talking about, on what Farr was talking about, and on life in general because he taught us supreme mathematics. Supreme mathematics is a science of everything in life. It was placed there which will enable us to measure all things in life. Our language which we speak is the supreme alphabet that enables us to explain that which we have measured. So Allah gave us a formula. He gave us the knowledge of his culture and the wisdom of his language so that we can understand ourselves, people, places, and things and be successful in life. Yo, Lakim, this, uh, this day, sitting here looking at you, I've been a fan of your music. Mm -hmm. As I told you at the beginning of the interview, since I first saw you in 88, you, was, mm -hmm. you were dropping a whole nother language that I had never heard and, and forced me to go and do some research. Mm -hmm. um, you, Chill Rob G, these two interviews I've done with y'all, man, have really made my YouTube career. This is my feather in my cap, man. Peace. And I want to thank you, thank the God, man, for coming through. Thank you, I appreciate building, it. And building with the God and making, making your word born, man. Definitely, man. I'm just performing my duty. That's my job, to teach civilization to the uncivilized, you know? Now, listen, how can... Yeah, listen, y'all go on the bottom of this video and click on watch Lakim's videos, dope videos on YouTube. Lakim, are you on social media? You working on any music? We, we want more music, man. Yes, the music is coming. I got music that's out there now from different collaborations I've done. My man, True Trilla, uh, Old 50 Boys. But at the same time, me and 45 King are working on some joints. We're going to sneak attack, y'all. Trust me, it's coming. It's coming. How can it? You on social media, La? Yes. Um, it's Lock Him the Pinnacle on um, Instagram. And on Facebook, it's just my honorable name, Lakeem S. Welch. All right, all right. right? Yo, y'all, listen, this is a stigmatism in my soul TV, man. This ain't the TV that tells lies to your vision. This is the TV that tells the truth to your vision, man. And, That's and, right. And, and lie, man, like I say once again, man, I want to thank you for uh, coming through, man. I want to get the 45 King, if you can no arrange doubt. that. And I want to get, yo, Latifah, we need you to come through, man. I'll reach out to her. Yeah, yeah. Yo, Latifah, <laughs> peace, peace. peace. my right. pleasure. Yeah.